All right, welcome back. This is still chapter five, and in the last video we were making box plots, and in this video we're gonna take an extra step here and uh, take a look at a few of these box plots, and we're going to compare them to other distributions. So, let's begin. Here we have the graph that we were looking at in the last video, this uh, average wind speed graph every single day taken up. And we can see, oops, that uh, again, this graph is unimodal and it's skewed to the right. We are going to remember that when we describe a histogram, and this uh, includes how we describe our box plots as well, that we're gonna remember our G socks. Uh, we're gonna talk about gaps. We're gonna talk about shape. We're gonna talk about outliers. We're going to talk about center. And we are going to talk about spread. So we want to describe these things uh, within a box plot as well as the histogram. And we can see those items the same way that we see them here. Uh, we can see that this shape is slightly skewed to the right because we can see that the 25% of the data on the right is larger than the 25% of the data on the left. So this one is skewed to the right because we see that difference. We can also see that the median here is measured right around 1.90 because that's the spot on the box plot. We can also do a, talk about a measure of spread that the middle 50% of the data is between 1.15 and 2.93. So all of these measures are here. Uh, we can say that there's a gap in the data between 6.5 and 8.67, somewhere around there. Uh, and then we also want to talk about this outlier out here. So all of these items that we would talk about in the histogram, we can see them in the box plot as well. Now, this is a single distribution. We are only describing this one distribution that we see right here. But like we said in the last video, oftentimes it is more interesting to compare da uh, similar data uh, of two different distributions to see if we can uh, gain any knowledge by that. So um, on this next slide, we have that same data. This is the same average wind speed data, but it is now broken up between the spring and summer months and the fall and winter months. So we can do that same compare uh, description of these, um, but we will now uh, do, the, do the same thing where we're talking about GSOX, right? We want to talk about our GSOX still. But when we compare the two, we need to write comparative statements um, about our GSOX. Uh, so for example, uh, we would say something like, <clears throat> There are, in the fall and winter months, there was a large gap between 6.5 and 8.9, whereas in the spring and summer months, there was no gap in the data. To talk about the shape, we can say the shape of the spring and summer months is unimodal and skewed to the right, whereas the shape to the, well, in, in a similar vein, the shape of the fall and winter is also skewed and, uh, excuse me, unimodal and skewed to the right. However, the fall and winter months tend to be a little bit uh, more spread out, right? So again, we can, we can find IQRs for these, and then we can say something about the IQR of this, where the middle 50% seems to be between uh, about 0.5 and 1.5, or 2, right in that area, whereas the inner quartile range for the fall and winter months appears to start at about 1.5 and go to uh, roughly 3.5. So we're making comparative statements about the two distributions. And again, in a full description, we need to address every GSOC, uh, GSOCs, with a comparative statement. That's an O, and that's an A. Comparative, wait, comparative. There we go, I can spell it. Uh, with a comparative statement. So we need to say the shape of this versus the shape of this, the center of this versus the center of this, the spread of this versus the spread of this, right? It's a, um, when we're comparing groups, we need to make sure that we're drawing comparative statements for each of the GSOCs in all of them. It's going to be a fairly large paragraph that you're writing when you're comparing groups. Um, and I will say that 
on the AP exam, you will almost be guaranteed to have to do some kind of uh, question in your free response where you're either writing a di about a distribution itself or comparing two distributions. And the way that they're scoring it is they're looking for your G socks, right? You have to address all of them with comparative statements, otherwise, you are losing points for that particular section. So every GSOC needs a comparative statement. The gaps in this versus the gaps in this. The shape in this versus the shape in this. The outliers in this versus the outliers in this. The center of this versus the center of this. And the spread in this versus the spread in that. It's a long bit of writing that you have to do. Um, but again, you have to do that, especially as part of the AP exam, uh, to get those points. Okay. So when we're comparing, we need to make sure that we're looking at all of those uh, those aspects and again that does tell us a lot about this distribution we can see from the distribution that the spring and summer months are significantly um, more tame than the fall and winter months because we have a lot more days of low wind than in the fall and winter the fall and winter have uh, more days of high wind and less days of low wind so the and i think that's in the united states anyway that's the that's that should be familiar to us if you're from a different part of the world then uh this data is going to look very different for you um but that, sh that should kind of like strike true now we can even take this uh this even further and here is that same set of data but this time uh spread out between all 12 months of the year now, if we were to describe this, uh, again, we would need to make sure that we're talking our GSOCs um, to compare the months. We, you know, if you have this many box plots, you can probably talk more about a general trend of things. For example, uh, we can kind of see here that the wind speeds, when you start uh, in January, they dip in the spring and summer months, and then we kind of go back up. In fact, they make what's called a sinusoidal shape sinusoidal I think everybody should say that out loud right now just because it's a really fun word to say sinusoidal uh, anyway it looks like a sine curve uh, so we can say that it has that and we see a definite dip in the wind speeds in those spring and summer months but then start to come back up in those fall months and it's not just the medians right we can see that same kind of curve in the upper quartiles um, the lower quartiles the same idea the minimums are still kind of there not as much but there um, in the upper quartiles uh, kind of there but less notice that the min the minimums and maximums are uh, less resistant to that um, uh, those large uh, those large numbers outside of the middle right our maximums and stuff are less resistant to that especially if you're looking at the month of November over here because this is that huge day that we had over here that's showing up as big outliers everywhere um, as it turns out uh, this is hurricane um, hurricane Karen this is hurricane Karen uh, it was in November uh, late November of uh, 1989 which is when this data was taken so we've got a hurricane there that's causing that huge outlier um, but again, this side-by-side -side view of these box plots tells us a lot more information about that wind speed data. This original graph, you know, it just gives us something that's skewed to the right. We're not entirely certain how that breaks down throughout the year. We can't see the difference in spring months, summer months, fall months, and winter months in this graph. But as you break it down and make a box plot for each one, it tells us a lot more interesting information about the average wind speed. So as we're gathering data and as you're looking at particular sets, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, breaking, da breaking data down into subsets can sometimes be very useful um, in giving us really interesting information. And again, we can see these, uh, these outliers in this day. Like we had a really windy day in July that was a, an outlier for that particular day. But this, this outlier in July was just an average day in November because it was 50%. Um, and, it, and breaking down the data this way allows us to see that kind of information that something that's an outlier in July is just normal in November. And something that is an outlier in November would be unheard of in July. Like this would be so far outside the normal wind patterns. Uh, that we would really start to question what was happening if this was happening in July 
because that's like you know something that high up is is basically like end of the world kind of things happening like there's lots of very terrible things going on because we have giant wind speeds like this in july so uh that's gonna be uh, uh that's really everything that we've got for chapter five um we're making box plots we're comparing distributions if uh there's anything you've got questions or anything like that feel free to leave them in the comments and thank you very much for watching and i uh, hope you join us for chapter six thanks bye